All right, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. So today we are going to skip ahead a little bit in the book and talk about texture mapping because this is something that you need for the practicals. And in fact, we have already covered most of the basic stuff from the book, most of the basic chapters. So a quick recap, we started by talking about vectors, how we can use, for example, those vectors as points to represent geometric objects like such as triangles. Last time we talked about matrix manipulation to transform those objects or those vectors with matrices. And at the very beginning, we already talked about introduced a very simple shading model that allows us to calculate influences of light on the color of a certain point in space. But of course, we only talked about a single point. We didn't really talk about the shade or the color on a whole surface. Of course, you already did this in the practicals. I think this is actually an image from the first uh, practical assignment, but you just called the related function in the API. So, uh, and of course the lecture, the idea of the lecture is to tell you or to teach you what is going on beyond those functions. Because if you have this additional knowledge, if you do not know only how to do something, but why you do it and what is really going on when you do it, you will of course get a better understanding that helps you then in creating better graphics in the long run. So uh, how can we do that? And of course we already know this basically because it is just, uh, uh, if you want to interpolate the colors smoothly between the, be, between the vertices of a triangle, we just make a linear interpolation, which is an interpolation in this case between two vectors, A and B, and then we multiply them with a weight t and one minus t. So this weight t is always between zero and one. And that means of course the sum of these two weights for these two vectors is also always, is always one. And that means if you look at the, the geometric case here, you see that for t equals zero, oh, t equals zero, we have of course the extreme case that we just have the vector a. And then for t increasing till the maximum case of t equals one, we see that the vector a decreases because of this weight here, and the vector b increases by the same, or by the opposite amount, in the same way, in a, in a way that makes this here, this vector here stay directly in the middle and basically move from a to the vector b, smoothly move or linearly move to b, which is why we call this a linear interpolation until we have the other extreme case, which means t is one. And then of course the first weight of the vector a is zero. So we just have the vector b here plus uh, the null vector. And of course this is, if you look at the formula, something that you already know because, oh, I hope you know, because I hope you already looked into the, the grading criteria for this course and then you have also seen it when you calculate the weight of your grades based on all the stuff that you have to do here. We are actually using kind of a similar weighting scheme here, which is then gives different uh, rates to different, uh, uh, different uh, achievements that you have in the course. And this is also, of course, a sort of a linear interpolation. There is, of course, another interpretation of this, which is also quite interesting in relation to graphics, uh, also to refresh our memories. Um, when we talked about the uh, linear, um, the basic geometric uh, uh, entities, we introduced the parametric equation of a line as a line that has a, a support vector and a direction vector. Now you see, if you take this weighting scheme from the linear interpolation and transform it in a way that you group all the vectors depending on the weight and have the independent vector here, then you get exactly the linear, the parametric equation of a line where A is the support vector and then B minus A is the direction vector. And if you did the tutorials, you also know that if we don't normalize this direction vector, but we have really the vector B minus A here, then for t equals zero, we are at position A. And then for t, we increase the direction, the size of the direction vector till we have t equals one, which reaches then exactly this vector B, which is then exactly the same case as we had in the, uh, 
in the other interpretation. So you see here this uh, fits also right well in this uh, line interpretation that we had. And of course now this is the linear interpolation. We have said we want to use this for color interpolation. But uh, <coughs> so we could also instead of a vector use just a single value here to do the linear interpolation like we do with when we calculate your grades. Then we just have one value or one grade for one uh, uh, assignment. Um, but of course, in, uh, in, when we have colors, we also often have uh, vectors or we represent colors by vectors because colors are very often represented, for example, by three values, red, green, and blue. And the combination of those then gives the color that is on the, on the computer screen. And then, of course, we have a vector. So we can easily interpolate, like we have seen here, along the line between A and B in this case, or along the vertex between C1 and C3 in this case. But of course, we also want to have color on the center of the, of the triangle. And of course, we can do that also easily by, at the same time as we are walking along the line here and putting calculating the colors here and here, we can also, of course, interpolate between these two colors here. And then we get the, the color on the, on the surface of the triangle. And we will later then talk about how to do this uh, in an efficient way and also how how to deal with things such as font shading, because of course font shading is not uh, supported by this kind of thing. Good. But for now we want to address, like I said, we want to skip ahead, jump ahead a little bit and talk about texture mapping, which is also a very popular way to put color and shadings and, and structure on objects, because if you think about, it, of course, with a triangle, you can model all kind of objects. But if you want to, for example, model a very complex structure like a piece of wood here in the image, then of course you would need a huge amount of triangle. It would just not be feasible uh, computationally wise. It's just too hard and too, too uh, expensive. Um, but of course, this is an image of wood and it looks like wood. So why model wood? Why, why model this? Why not just take the image? And that's the basic idea of texture mapping. And uh, I mean, you already know this probably from, from tiling where you take a, a single texture that looks equally structured, uh, uh, looks kind of uh, symmetrically. And then if you tile it, I purposely left some space here in between when I made this image to illustrate that these are single tiles. But of course, if you fill that space and if the texture is chosen appropriately, then you can imagine that this really looks like a huge image or a huge wall of wood and it doesn't really look like a small image. And this is basically the trick that we use with texture mapping that we put these images on our objects and then create the illusion as if we have really that material material there, although it is just an image of that material. Yeah, so this is the basic idea of texture mapping. We put the, the uh, images on the objects, or in general, we put, we take some general texture that we have pre-calculated or pre-created and put it on our objects, because this texture doesn't necessarily have to be a 2D image that we paste on our 3D object. It could also be a 3D texture, a structure in 3D that has certain color information about how this 3D block would look like, like in this example here that illustrates it quite nicely, a piece of marble stone. And then we take that to create our 3D texture. So we say we have this block where for each position in a 3D space, we have the color information. And we have our 3D model where we also have, where we have the coordinates of the points on the model surface in 3D. And then we map those two to each other. And then we have, of course, also a 3D, a texture applied to that model. In this case, it's a 3D texture. So, and this is what, uh, and, and that is often called also solid or volumetric texturing because of course we have a volume or a solid texture, whereas the, the other, the 2D mapping where we map a 2D object to a 3D object is called Imaged, Im image textures or image mapping. Good, and we'll start with the 3D mapping here uh, today with a few examples. Um, be careful with this, the 3D and 2D here refers actually to the textures like you see here in the image, uh, because I will use a few examples for 2D objects also because it's uh, like so often easier to explain than for 3D objects. I will also talk about 3D objects uh, every now and then. Um, so. Be careful to not confuse this. On the one hand, we have the 2D and the 3D textures. On the other hand, we have the 2D or the 3D object space where we want to map those 2D or 3D textures to. Good. Yeah, so let's start with a very uh, rather simple case of 3D texturing, which is so-called procedural texturing, where we take the texture and not create the 3D texture, but we, cre uh, we 
or, or we, we create it not before the actual uh, uh, texturing, but we encode it in a function. So we have a mathematical function that takes three values, which are then, of course, our three points in our 3D space, and maps it to a single value, which is then, of course, the color we want to put on that particular point in space. Of course, if the color is represented as a vector, we have a, ver a function from three points to three points and not from three to one as illustrated here. But of course, these three points that it points to are unique and represent then just one color, which is why, of course, uh, it's here written just with a value C. Good. So the idea is we have the function that calculates or, or we have uh, a 3D object like this T part here. Let's look at this one here. And then we say, OK, this is the surface and there is a point here on the surface. And I want to know what kind of color do I have to point, draw here to have this nice uh, line pattern here. And then you take the point, put the coefficients in the function, and then you get a color value as a return, and that is then, of course, the color value you put there. So what it would, could be such a kind of function, and if you look at the teapot, you see, of course, if the, uh, be careful here, the coordinate system is x, y, and the set points in that direction, because it should resemble, of course, a, a screen, and that's why the y points to the top and not the set, as you usually do when you, uh, when you draw it. Um, so if you look at this, we see that for each that this, this line is basically parallel to the Z and Y axis. So if we make a cut through the object at one position on the X axis and make a put a plane there that is parallel to the Z and Y axis, you will see, you see that we have the very same color at the object for all the points that inter the, where the plane intersects with the object. So that means the Z and the Y value actually have no influence on this pattern. It's only the X value. So we can calculate the color by ch taking just an alternating function that gives us red, white, red, right at a certain distance from each other. And one of that would, of course, be the sine function. So we can make a procedure that takes all the three points, but of course we only need the x point because as I said it only depends on the x coordinate. And then we check is the sine of the x larger than zero, then we say we color it red. If it is not, then we color it white. And that way we get this linear, uh, this stripe texture on our teapot. Very simple and very easy. Of course we could use all other kinds of alternating functions. You can say if the value is odd or even, we give it a color, but it has to be a periodic function that alternates between two options that we can easily check. Yeah, and this is, of course, the generalization to, to 3D. I tried to illustrate it a little bit, but I think it should be clear. Good. And of course, we cannot only do this on the x-axis. We can also do it at the z-axis, which is this case here. So this is for the z-axis, and of course, this is the x-axis, and this is then the variation on the y-axis, and uh, it should be clear how we have to change our algorithm to do this here. But of course, we also don't want to have, we don't want to just have patterns that depend on one coordinate, but we also want to have patterns that depend on two or three coefficients. And uh, one example is this here, where we say we give it a specific color if both the x and the z value of the sine functions are larger than zero. If you think about what that means or how it look like, x is larger than zero creates a pattern like this. Z is larger than zero creates a pattern like this. So if you have the end function, that means only the intersection points here are visible. And of course, it doesn't depend on the Y value. So this should basically be like a 3D block here. And depending, of course, from where you look at, if you look at it from here, it still looks like uh, a line pattern. But if you look at it from here, then of course, it looks like a little bit like a checkerboard, not really a checkerboard, because from the top it looks like this, of course. So these are the colors. And a real checkerboard would, of course, be something like that, where we also have the color here. And the reason why I'm mentioning checkerboards here is, of course, that this is part of the practical assignment. So you basically, this is uh, kind of the, the idea behind it. You just have to change the condition a little bit to achieve this here. Also be careful, of course, with the x, y, and z axis here. It is drawn in a way that, like I said, when you look at it from the front, you still get a line pattern. For the exercises, you want to have something where you look at it from that side. So uh, be careful where you choose your x, y, and z values here. 
Good, but with that, I think it should be should be clear and should or it should be uh, uh, relatively easy to figure it out how to do this uh, chessboard pattern. Another thing you want to be uh, want to have, of course, when you implement this is with the sine function, you always get the same width of the lines of the stripes, which is pi, because after two pi the function repeats itself, and after pi it changes its sign. So if we just check for the sign, of course, we get only line patterns with the same width, which is of course not very flexible and not what we want. Um, so if we want to have a variable width based on a periodic function, of course what we usually do is we take, we scale it, so we divide, usually divide it by the length of the period and then multiply it by the width that we want to have. Because of the division, we normalize it between 0 and 1 and then we multiply it with the width and then we should get the width. Now if you look at what I've written here, it's actually exactly the opposite. I multiply it with, with, uh, with the pi instead of uh, normalizing it, so dividing it, and then I divide by the width instead of multiplying it. But the trick here is, or the reason for that is, if you look at that, the, the point is that we're looking into the, uh, into the sine function. So we're, we want to normalize the sine function, but we do this by manipulating the argument. It becomes clear when you look at the actual sine function, you see here it is periodic and it reaches after p half, after pi half, it reaches the maximum and then it goes to, uh, after pi, it changes its sign. Now, if you say you multiply x, for example, by 2, then of course this here, pi divided by 2, is suddenly pi because, and that means you reach that maximum, of course, half of the time earlier. In the same way, if you divide it by 2, you reach it. It takes twice as long till you reach your maximum. So you see that the wavelength behaves opposite to how you normalize and multiply the, uh, the uh, coefficient for it. And that's why, of course, if it behaves opposite, you have to also do the opposite. And that's why you have to be careful here that this is a multiplication divided by the width, although intuition would immediately say, well, if I normalize it, I should divide it by the length and then multiply it with the width. Good. Yeah, so uh, try this at home or in BBL 175 for the practicals. This is something that I think is not part of the practicals, but nevertheless, of course, it is interesting to, to try it out. Um, it's just another variation of it where we can say, okay, we have line patterns now, we can make them variable with the width, but it would also be nice to have like not such strict lines, but to have more smooth transitions with them or to vary them in a certain way. For example, by making the borders less strict, but making it more this uh, nice transition here. And uh, this is a function that does this now, if you look at the bottom here, that is something that should look familiar if you didn't come late today, because that is what we had at the beginning with the linear interpolation. So we just make a linear interpolation between two color values, but it's actually not a linear interpolation because the weight t is not linear, the weight t depends on the sign. So what does that mean? The y, and, and that is of course why we have this nice transition here. Um, and we can see what that means if we look look into the if we compare this with with a linear interpolation. So initially we had just basically a binary decision that we said, okay, if it is larger than zero, it's color one. If it is lower than zero, then it's color zero. And if we do a linear interpolation now, then of course we say it is one at a maximum, and then at this point the other color has its maximum. And in between the weight decreases and the weight for the other color increases. So the influence of the other color increases until it is maximum and the influence of that color decreases on this, until it is minimum. But it does so linearly, which is why we get this strict uh, regular change, but it is a very, uh, yeah, it is regular. Each step is uh, the same amount. And if we use the sine function, you see it, it goes a little smoother, the sine function decreases a little slower, so it the influence of the other color becomes less immediately apparent at the beginning, 
and then it becomes a little uh, almost linear and then the influence of the second color comes in much stronger than it comes here and the influence of the first color decreases uh, much stronger uh, much faster and uh, this is basically what it does here what you see here because we need weights between 0 and 1 and they have to add up to 1 we cannot just take the sine function as we did before but we have to take the sine function because the sine function goes from positive to negative so we have to what we do here is we shift it up by 1 and then we have it of course between 2 and 0 then we have only positive values but it's still too large and that's why we divide it by 2 and then we have our function between 0 and 1 that gives us uh, a smooth variation of our weights good yeah, so uh, these are just some examples for some procedural uh, methods and of course these are uh, uh, very nice and very interesting. You can do a lot of things with those. But it is still like a, a mathematical function that, that calculates something and if it's uh, something that you calculate and of course you, you usually have some regularity in it but of course we also want to have textures that are more irregular I mean that that was the I used that actually as a motivation while we we're doing texture mapping in the first place that I said I want to have something that has a structure that is not easy to calculate that is really irregular or, or has some uh, sort of pattern uh, has some sort of pattern but it's not really that uh, easily visible and um, that is something that we can achieve very easily with the second approach, this so-called array lookup, where we say we have a pre-calculated texture, or we cr a designer created a pre-calculated texture, texture, and then we just do a mapping between our 3D object space and that texture, and then put the color on the on the object in that way. And we can do that, of course. Um, so this this carving idea is kind of the the intuition behind it or the intuition behind the procedural approach is kind of this carving idea but we could also do it by array lookup if we already have this texture stored in an array and then we can have it stored of course in a 2d array like in this case here where we have a 2d array but we could also store it in a 3d array and then we just say this is our point we map it somehow to this texture here, or this is our point here on the top, and then we see, okay, if we map it to the texture, then this is the color that we have to put on the teapot at this position, and then instead of this line pattern, we get this nice marble structure. So this is the idea of this uh, array lookup, and uh, let's just look at, uh, at a simple example, which is uh, for 2D now uh, only. Um, where we say we want to do this uh, typical tiling that I also had with these wood pieces at the beginning. So we say we have on the right side an object space where we have an object. In this case I drew a triangle but we just want to look into this one particular point now. And we have a texture and we want to map that texture with tiles onto our object in our UV space. We call this the UV space. Although uh, some later then be careful with this uh, notation later. Also, the, I'm, I'm taking usually the notation from the book here. And later sometimes they call the texture space the UV space. So be, be careful with that. It's a little, could be a little confusing. But here we, we're talking about the object space. We split that in a UV space and then we have to map that. And we want to do that with tiling. So we have to create the tiles first. And one simple way to do that is to say, we're just removing the integer part of our UV values and that way we get only values between 0 and 1 and we split the, the uh, no we, we split our space in single tiles that only have the values between 0 and 1 so for example if we have the point UV here at 2.2 and 1.25 then of course we can represent that by 0 0.2 and 0 0.25 but all points in the other tiles at that position have of course then the same modified u and v values which means that they will end up having the very same color here which is exactly what we want with the tiling so what we need now is just a mapping of that tile to that image which uh, are sometimes it's called we call this then the texels in relation to the pixels so we need a, a mapping from the object or pixel space to the texel space and 
That is because we have these tile now, tiles now and uh, we have a rectangle on the left side, just a simple uh, mapping, a simple scaling. In this case, it's, even very, it's actually very simple because the u and v values are between 0 and 1, which means we just need to multiply the size of the texture with these values. It's clear, of course, if we have like uh, the point is at half here, then of course it is the half point that is at half here. If we do this as a quarter here, then it's of course the point that is at a quarter here. So we just need to multiply it and then we have our corresponding point. Almost, because when we multiply that, of course, very unlikely that we will hit an integer value, but on the left side we really have an array with texels, so that is really are really index values, integer values. So we need to kind of get an integer value out of that uh, 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 calculation. And that can be easily done, for example, using the so-called floor function, which gives you the highest integer value that is smaller or equal to the value that you put in, which basically means if we have a square here, then and we end up anywhere in that square, we map it to the lower left border of the square, if, of course, only this here is 0, 0. Yeah. Now, uh, that's a very easy way to do this. One problem with this is, of course, I try to illustrate it here with these uh, very bright colors. Even if that might not be a very realistic case, um, but to just to illustrate it. If we have, for example, this square here with these four different colors, and the black spot is where our mapping hits. If we use then the floor function, we will map it to here, but we'll also map all other points that are here to this particular color. And we'll map all points that are here to this particular color. Now you could say, of course, yeah, I don't have to do it like that with the flow function. I could use a real nearest neighbor interpolation where I say I really map it to the nearest neighbor. But in any case, you end up having these larger blocks of individual colors. And even if the colors are not as extreme as I did it here to illustrate it to, so you can see it better, it can create some artifacts in your texture because you, you, you really have this abrupt change. And this change is for all the points that, that are here. It's the same change. So it's really can create some artifacts in your image, which is why we often also use interpolation like we did at the beginning with the triangle but here we are in a 2d space so we have to do bilinear interpolation which looks a little uh, 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 complicated but it's actually just uh, a simple generalization of the 2d case uh, let me mark this here so you see it a little better these are the colors so you see here we run the colors over all four before that we had two vectors so we had only two values between we interpolate. Now we have four values between we are interpolating. And for the weights, we choose this u dash, which is defined as exactly the co coordinates of this black dot, our target here, minus the floor function of that, which basically means we're cutting off this integer part. So the u dash and v dash are exactly these parts here that give us the distance from this color at the lower left border. Now if you look at what kind of weights we use for that color, we're using exactly the opposite, which makes sense of course because if this point, the closer this point is to this color, the larger uh, these weights get, which means the larger the influence of this color is, which of course makes sense. If the point is closer to this color, this color should be more considered. And if it is further away from that color, then of course this color should be less considered in the sum of the colors that we calculate for this point here. And if you look into the weights of this one, and you see these are exactly these two weights here, which get approximate zero the closer we get here, or reach zero if we are at this point. And then of course the influence of that color decreases. So the more we move away from a color, the more the weight increases, the closer we get to one of the vertices, the more the influence of the color on that vertex uh, in influences, in, uh, in, uh, the more the influence on that, on the final color uh, of that vertex increases. Good. Um, yeah, and the, the influence changes, of course, linearly, because again, we have a linear weight. 
Good, and then of course the 3D case is pretty much the same. I didn't explain it in 3D because it's difficult to draw and also uh, a lot of writing that you have to do. I, I didn't even write it down here, but you can look up the formula in the book. It looks very confusing at first, but again, mark the colors. Then you will see the colors go over all eight vertices in this case now. And the weight has just a third value there which is then of course the third dimension and again you see that the closer we are to one vertex the more the influence of that color good yeah um i'm just looking at the clock because um the next part i'm not sure if i can fit it till the break but I would like to have it in one block because it doesn't make sense to cut it in between. So I uh, apologize if I'm, right, uh, if I'm pushing the brake a little back today. Good. Um, yeah, so I said with this uh, um, mathematical function, when we use the procedural approach, we have a mathematical function and that always or very often creates a more regular texture, a more regular pattern. But that does not, I use that to motivate, of course, why we do the array lookup, but it does not necessarily have to be the case. Even with a mathematical function, we can create some sort of apparently randomness or some sort of noise. And uh, by, of course, introducing randomness and noise into our calculation. And uh, uh, so we can, with a mathematical function, calculate patterns that look, for example, like a piece of wood or like a marble. And these are, yeah, it's, um, I mean, if you think about it like a piece of wood, if you take two pieces of wood, none of the two pieces look 100% alike. Each in piece of wood is unique and individual. But of course, if you take a couple of pieces of wood, you will always see, okay, these are all obviously pieces of wood. So they look somehow alike, but are all somehow also different. The same with marble. No two pieces of marble look alike. So they are on the one hand completely unique and random. On the other hand, they are not completely random because if you look at it, you immediately see this is marble. And if you have two pieces of marble, you can say this is the same marble or this is a different marble because it has some sort of structure in there. So the difficult thing when we want to do that is how can we, or the difficult question here is how can we make a mathematical function that calculates us patterns, textures that have a certain structure that looks kind of random, but not too random. So it also should have some regularity. So, um, <clears throat> and this is the, the idea of this calculation uh, for, for what we will do now with this, this perline or solid noise. So uh, to, to motivate that, let's, let's just uh, think a little bit about what we could do to create some more randomly looking textures. Of course, the most straightforward thing you could come up with is to say, well, why don't I not just use random numbers to make the colors? I could, for example, use uh, white and green and variations and black and variations between that. And then I say, okay, uh, when I use them randomly, it is more likely that I get white instead of black and green. And then maybe I get up, uh, end up having such a marble structure like we have here on the teapot. But that of course will not work out because if you just purely do it randomly, you get something that is similar to this white noise on the TV that you get when you unplug your antenna. Um, it's then maybe a little uh, greenish white noise, but it is still too chaotic. So we want to have something that has a little less randomness and that resembles a little more this marble structure or wood structure or whatever we want to model. So uh, uh, we could think about, well, can we not just filter the noise or, or smooth it out a little bit with some functions? And depending on how you do that, that might actually work. But of course, it is a lot of calculation and this calculation is usually too computationally expensive. Or if it is not computationally expensive, the result is not what you want and it doesn't really model what you want. So we can say then as an extra, well, why, why don't we fall back on the approach that we already had and use this lattice approach with this uh, 3D array also for the procedural calculation, but then create random numbers and then interpolate within them because then we should have more regularity, but because we have random numbers, it is still, uh, we have some randomness in there, some noise there that might then look like these uh, uh, marbles or woods. Um, and the problem, and, and 
that is actually basically the idea of this of this uh, solid noise. The only problem, or the, the problem with that, is if you do it that way, then you still have you have maximum color values at the vertices, and then you, when you do a linear interpolation between them, the grid structure kind of becomes apparent. You don't see this grid structure as actual points, but you see you have a maximum, and then it linearly the color moves to another color, and then it linearly moves to an, uh, 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 transitions to another color. And that, of course, is some regularity that you will recognize in your textures. So you have to, you cannot use it this way. So you have to do something about that. And that is what uh, is now this, this so-called Perlin noise, or the book calls it uh, very often solid noise. But if you look in the literature, actually, you might find more often the term Perlin noise because that's the, the guy who invented it, who came up with this idea. And the idea it says here is basically. Uh, using three tricks to come up with this. So this is a, maybe a general uh, state, uh, comment I have to make. Very often in graphics, if you look at an algorithm, you, uh, I mean, there are a lot of things that are really strictly formulated, like we had it so far when we talked about vector transformation and you have a clear input, a clear output, and everything that is not that output is wrong. You can verify that. But if it comes to actually creating the images, it's not really that clearly uh, clearly uh, verifiable. It's not like in, 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 in exact sciences where you can say, okay, this is uh, one plus one is two, and if it's not, then your result is wrong. But it's more the idea is, I want to create an image that looks good, or an image that looks realistic, or that looks natural. And that is not really quantifiable with some sort of measurement. And very often in graphics, we have, like if you look at papers from graphics conferences, you often see people presenting an algorithm that says, okay, my algorithm calculates the wood structure in a better way than everything before. And I demonstrate this by showing examples and comparing them to these other algorithms. And then everyone looks at it and would say, yeah, well, it actually looks better. So your algorithm is really better. So this is why we accept this paper and publish it in our conference or in our journal. And uh, but if you look then at the algorithm, it's kind of hard sometimes to understand, yeah, why did they come up with this? And this is also why I want to hear, not go into too much details of the mathematics, but explain you a little bit, uh, focus more on the motivation behind it, why we have these formulas here and what they mean and why he might have come up with them in the first place. Because if you look at it, it really looks like a, a big hack to create images. And that's actually what it is. It's just a couple of rules that improve our results. So let's look into those rules. The first rule is to use a virtual 3D array. So that is basically the idea of using this lattice, this grid, the 3D grid, like we had with the 3D array, where we used a pre-calculated texture. But here he uses a virtual 3D array with random vectors. And the only reason why he does that is to uh, for efficiency. So you don't have to store the whole 3D array. And uh, I will that will hopefully become clear when I explain how we do that. Then he doesn't take random values at the colors, but he takes the inner product with a certain, with the UVW vector, which sounds strange at the moment, but the motivation behind that is to avoid these local maxima and minima that we otherwise get. And then he does a Hermite interpolation between them, which is a different kind of interpolation, not a linear interpolation, but a different kind of interpolation. Actually, it's an interpolation to the power of three. We'll see that also. And that should deal with this problem of that the structure is that the interpolation is too regular if we do a linear interpolation. And hopefully, this will become clear when we go through all the steps. So let's first think about how can we create such a 3D array of random values uh, or random vectors. And like I said, you will see later why we're using vectors and not values. So the idea is basically we have a grid and we want to have random values for each of the vertices here. But of course, if we have a huge texture, then this is very inefficient. So to keep things efficient, he's only dealing with a one-dimensional array and then uses that to create the 3D array out of it. But to get the values, the vectors for these one-dimensional arrays, he takes three random numbers between 0 and 1, but he wants to have values between minus 1 and 1. 
So what he does is he multiplies it by two and then he subtracts one and that's kind of similar to what we did with the sine function, only there we shifted it up and then we multiplied with one half. But it's basically just a, a rescaling from zero one to minus one to one. And then that way he can create random vectors. The problem with that approach is, um, uh, and then he normalized them and then he can has, uh, uh, unit vectors, but the pro no, no, he doesn't normalize. And he, then he, he has uh, vectors between minus one and one. The problem with that approach is, of course, that you do not have a random distribution that is equally, because if you look at it, uh, that can be illustrated quite nicely in the 2D case. If you look, if you think about it, you have the unit circle, and with that here, you create all random vectors, can create, oops, sorry, all random Here, all random vectors in the unit circle. So in each direction that you can go here from the center, it is equally likely that the error ends up there. But also, since this line is longer, of course, it is more likely if the distribution of the vectors is really equal, uh, the distribution of these numbers is really equal, it is of course more likely that you get a vector in that direction than you get a vector in that direction because this vector here, this distance here, has this additional space here. So if each vector that you get here is equally likely and you get more vectors here, then of course it is more likely that you get a vector like this than a vector like this. So if we really want to have it equally distributed, what, we, what he does is basically just saying, okay, we get a random vector, and if it is within that part here, which is exactly this condition here, then we just throw it away. And that way he only, he reduces our space for the random vectors here to exactly the circle, which means every vector in that circle is equal, has an equal likelihood because we just ignore and throw away those that go beyond the circle. And that is this condition here. Uh, I wrote it here R, but it could of course also be one because this is one and you see this, this is just from the length of the vector if it is smaller than one, which means smaller than the, than the uh, radius of the unit circle, then we take it. If not, we throw it away. Good, and he reports that he uses 256 to produce good results. And you see here, this is what I meant earlier when I said it sounds like a really big hack because it's just, yeah, I tried it and 256 is a number. If we take that many random points, the car, it's, we get really good results, but it is still computationally wise feasible. If we increase the number, of course, the results might uh, not, is not getting worse, but the computational, uh, it gets computationally more expensive. So if we find a good, it's looking for a good trade-off, then he did some experiments and then he said, okay, with this quality, with this number, the quality looks very good and it's still computationally feasible. So you see, this is a lot of trial and error and uh, yeah. You can call it a hack or you can call it a very, very smart and clever approach. In the end, it's only important if it works or not. And it does work. So yeah, and now I said we want to have a 3D array, but we only have a 1D array. And the reason is indeed, of course, the, the computational uh, part. So what we do now is we create a pseudo-random 3D array of these random unit vectors. And it's called pseudo-random because it looks random for a human who looks into the values, but um, it is of course not really random because we are calculating it each time and every time we're calculating we get the same result with this, which means it is not random if we can reproduce it all the time, but it looks random, which is why we call it often pseudo-random. And what he does here is he uses a hash function gamma that looks very weird, so maybe I uh, explain it with an image. What we have here is we have a point i, j, and k in our array. And we want to reach that point and we want to now have a value there. And what he does is he uses this gamma function. Uh, uh, what he does is he basically uses the index value. First, he makes a permutation of the k value. Then he adds it to the j value, makes another permutation. Then he adds it to the i value, makes another permutation. And then he does Use that, uses that as an index into this array. And the purpose of this permutation is basically just to 
create some chaos here to basically shift it in a way and access them in a way that does not produce some regularity so it really looks random although it is not so it is just just a, a hack a trick and then of course we have the same situation as before that we say we have a uvw value we map that to a point here and then we can map those vertices to here and then we kind of have to interpolate between those and then of course here the other part comes into play these two parts here the inner product and the hermite interpolation because i said if we use the colors here, we always have the maximum uh, of the color here. No matter how we do the interpolation, it always goes from the maximum color here to the next maximum of the color here, which is why you, ha why you see sometimes some regularity in the pattern if you, look, if you do it that way. And the other thing is then how you do the interpolation. But even if you do the interpolation differently, you always have the maximum here, which is why he doesn't use random values but he uses a random vector and then he multiplies that random vector so this is the random vector and then he multiplies that with the uvw vector which is the vector pointing to our point uvw so for this year we have a vector and for this year we have a vector for this year we have a vector so this is not really the illustration of the vectors they are not in that space it's just a informal thing to 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 make it clear and then we have this vector here and then he multiplies them and gets a scalar value and that scalar value is then uh, a little bit shifted basically from the original one it kind of the effect is that the maximum of the color that we have is kind of a little bit shifted so yeah maybe i shouldn't draw it that way because it's not really vectors that you multiply here that is of course the vector that you use here for the multiplication but you see here what he basically does is just taking these two vectors to create a scalar value and then he multiplies that with a weight and then he sums up the weight which looks very complex or complicated but it actually is not because if you think about what the floor function says you said you see here that this is basically just if we have a point here then it just gives you this i here and the i plus one here and the j here and the j plus one here and the k here and the k plus one here so what it basically does to sum it just sums up over all the eight uh, vertices that we have for this cube if you don't see that from the sum just write it down that helps to to understand it and you will see this is just a sum over all the four vertices and for each vertex we have this random value which is then used to create the color of our texture and of course we have a weight and now instead of the linear weight like I, like we learned before we're using a different weight because the linear weight would lead to this uh, uh, this visible artifacts that we have a very smooth transition he uses a weight a, a so-called hermite interpolation which uses a weight to the power of three so it's not linear anymore and why this produces better result can also be easily understood or can kind of uh, uh, be made clear by looking at the actual function if you would take a linear weight then of course if this is one color and this is the other color then if you move from one side to the other you see here the one color the influence of one color increases in the same amount as the other decreases which is why you have this regular color change and here you also have a regular color change but it is smoother kind of like we had with the sine function here uh, at the beginning so if you're closer to a center of a color then the change is less stronger then it becomes almost linear until you re get closer to the other color and then the influence of that color becomes much much stronger and the influence of the other gets less much quicker than with the linear case which means like we have more the typical things that you also have with a marble where you have uh, uh, this marble structure where you have then a dark color and then it doesn't smoothly go into the white color but it goes more abruptly but still smooth at the corners and this is exactly what you get with this hermite interpolation so you see here it's just basically a collection of hacks that put together but produce very good results very nice results it's um, um, actually a lot of uh, if you if you google hermite interpolation uh, and do the image search on google you see a lot of like really cool results like how, what you can do like uh, modeling sky modeling uh, wood modeling uh, all kinds of marble structures so this is something that's really also fun to play around with which is why we actually had it in a second practical two years ago 
but then we realized it was a little too much for a lot of people, so we moved it to the third one. So we haven't decided on the third yet, but uh, it's a good chance that you will have it in the third practical, and you can also play around a little bit with it. So let's just summarize the basic idea, because that is maybe, an, again, an informal image that uh, is not representing the actual situation, but kind of... Uh, I saw this once uh, online, and I found it quite nicely illustrating it. If we take a regular grid, let's look at just a 1D case, and then we say, okay, we produce random numbers here to create our noise, and then we do a linear interpolation. Then we have this problem that in between we have a smooth transition which is visible and not really what you naturally have in marble, for example. And even if you make a smoother transition here, we will always have the maximum value at a regular position. Now, what Hermite interpolation basically does is, first of all, it uses this uh, thing to just make it computationally feasible, because we're also dealing with vectors here, not with single values. And the reason why we're dealing with vectors here is that we basically take these values here that we randomly created, and then we shift them a little bit in random positions, because we're multiplying them with a random vector, so we're interpolating between these values here now. And then we do not a linear interpolation, but this Hermite interpolation, which is a more, I'm pretty sure I will draw it very badly. But you kind of, I hope, get the idea that because we're shifted it a little bit and doing this smoother transition, if you just do one of them, if you just do a smooth transition here, you still have the maxima. If you just shift the maxima and do the linear interpolation, you still have this smooth transition between uh, this this regular transition between them. So only by the combination of the two, you really get something that looks more random and more chaotic than the, the other case, but still not too chaotic that we can still model these uh, very interesting things.